Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the University of Washington School of Law, the Sustainable International Development Graduate Program here at the School of Law, uh, the International Human Rights Clinic at the School of Law, and the UW Center for Human Rights, I'm pleased to welcome everybody to the university. Um, Please give a warm welcome to our evening's uh, award recipient, the ACLU, former U.S. Congressman Jim McDermott, uh, the Washington State Religious Campaign Against Torture, and many other distinguished sponsors of this award um, and supporters who are here tonight, and uh, also to all of the students and guests who are joining us this evening. Thank you very much. My name is Alejandra Gonza. I direct the International Human Rights Clinic. And we always talk to my students about the United uh, States uh, obligations toward international law. We talk several times about the Convention Against Torture and how the US is the only one of the few uh, treaties that signed, is signed and ratified by the United States and some sort of legislation was implemented. But we are in a time that we still are uh, in dire need of accountability. And I think this is why this panel is so important today, to learn for those efforts to bring justice, to learn from those efforts to give the victims redress. And not always a settlement is the happiest end for us that we thrive for having precedence and making advanced uh, jurisprudence and making more impact more victims, but they bring a lot of good things to the table, even for victims. So I welcome you all, and I'm happy to uh, talk to you and hear about uh, your the lessons you learned from all these uh, new um, trial that settled. Thank you. Um, and it's our pleasure to introduce Robert Crawford, co-founder. Oh, pardon me. It's our pleasure to introduce Robert Crawford, co-founder of the Washington State Religious Campaign uh, Against Torture, and Professor Emeritus here at the University of Washington Tacoma, who will be facilitating the evening's discussion. Welcome, everybody, and welcome, distinguished panel members. <coughs> The Washington State Religious Campaign Against Torture has organized three events this September. The first two were in Spokane. One was called Why Torture is Wrong. Seems like a very easy subject to talk about, or a difficult subject to talk about, but uh, we decided that it was needed. We also held an event at Gonzaga University Law School called The Legal Obligation to Prevent and Prosecute torture. This event is called the moral and political obligation to resist torture. So resisting torture in the post 9-11 era, resistance to torture has taken many different forms. Dissent from individuals within the military, the security agencies, and other government bodies. <coughs> the, <coughs> investigative reporting, many legal challenges, congressional challenges, including important investigations from Congress, the mobilization of popular resistance through the work of national, international, religious organizations, human rights organizations, and grassroots efforts at the local level to raise citizen awareness. Not least, resistance is about the willingness of people like you, to become informed and find ways to respond. This event is co-sponsored by the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, the Center for Victims of Torture, the UW Center for Human Rights, the UW School of Law, the UW Sustainable International Development Graduate Program, UW International Human Rights Clinic, and the UW Department of Political Science, Amnesty International, Puget Sound, Western Washington, <coughs> Western Washington, uh, and Seattle Fellowship of Reconciliation, Veterans for Peace, Greater Seattle, ACLU of Washington, and the Peace Action Group of Plymouth Church, UCC. Also, it is co-sponsored by our allies in Spokane, 
Peace and Justice Action League of Spokane and Spokane Veterans for Peace. I want to give special thanks to Amnesty International Puget Sound and to the National Religious Campaign Against Torture who generously funded these events. Also, my appreciation to all the others who have donated to make this happen. Also, I want to give special thanks to all those people who worked so hard, to Gene Buskin, to Nina Butarik, to Jamie Mayerfeld, to Tom Yule, and others who worked hard on this event. <clears throat> we imagined this event a few months ago when we heard that there would be a trial in Spokane and that the judge in Spokane had refused all attempts to dismiss a case against the two psychologists who had designed and then participated in the implementation of CIA torture, James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen. As you probably know, the case on August 17th was settled out of court. This case was brought by the ACLU on behalf of three plaintiffs, Suleiman Abdullah Salim, Mohammed bin Soud, and the family of Gul Rahman, who was killed, died in detention in Afghanistan as a result of torture. We were disappointed that the trial did not occur, and yet we understand and applaud that the settlement was a crucial stepping stone in bringing accountability for torture. It was also a significant recognition of the physical and psychological suffering of the three plaintiffs. Thus tonight, we want to give an award of recognition to the ACLU for their crucial work on the Mitchell and Jessen case and for advancing the all-important goal of accountability for torture. Accepting the award for the ACLU is Lizelle Rubucchio, and presenting the award to the ACLU will be former Congressman Jim McDermott, who needs no introduction to this audience. Congressman McDermott, we are honored that you are a part of this event. Thank you. You don't have to stand up here for the whole of my talk here. Um, I was deeply honored when Peter Jackson called me and asked me if I would come and do this um, because I have more than a passing interest in this issue. I'm a psychiatrist and when the waterboarding occurred at Abu Ghraib and, and we saw what was going on, uh, I spent a good bit of time trying to figure out well, who's putting this together and how are they doing this? Who's given the authorization? How's it been put together? And I found these two guys over in Spokane in my own investigation. Uh, it was impossible to do anything during the Bush administration on this issue, but when uh, Mr. Obama was elected, he immediately made an executive order uh, outlawing uh, torture in the military. And I saw an opportunity at that point to put that executive order into law. Now, <clears throat> you all understand there are three branches of government. There's the executive who can say things, and then there's the Congress that can make law out of it. And so we put, I put this amendment together uh, to enshrine in law the executive order of President Obama. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was the speaker at that point. Uh, she agreed with me. We put it in the manager's amendment for the CIA authorization. And it was headed down the road to getting into law. As soon as it became publicly known, the intelligence community and the Republican Party came apart at the seams and descended on Nancy, and it was pulled out of the bill. It did not happen. Which shows you that executive orders, they're great, but when things change and somebody else is there, you wind up having it disappear. And that's what's happened. Uh, you now have a president who's talking about, well, maybe a little torture isn't a bad thing. That executive order of Mr. Obama's gone. So when I saw that the uh, ACLU 
was going after these two guys in Spokane, I was wholeheartedly behind them. Uh, I must say, I changed some of my giving uh, habits last year. Uh, and ACLU got a lot more because I believe that the courts are where we are going to make the only difference we have left. If the courts fail us, this country is in serious trouble. And are the ACLU's taking this on and, and uh, is, in my view, a signal event to the country that we do not accept torture. And it, it is, in my view, a very important thing that they did. They didn't get everything. You never get everything. I never got any, everything and anything I ever wanted. But they got, they got a, made a mark on the wall, and they're going to move from there. And so it's with great pleasure that I present to the ACLU the Washington State Religious Com Campaign Against Torture recognizes the invaluable work of the American Civil Liberties Union in advancing civil and criminal accountability for all U.S. officials and the U.S. government contractors who acted illegally to design, authorize, oversee, and carry out torture. We thank the ACLU in particular for its recent successful civil case against James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen in Spokane, Washington. The settlement reached on August 17, 2017 is a legal and moral my milestone toward achieving accountability for torture. Congratulations. Thank you, Representative McDermott, and thank you to the Washington State Religious Campaign Against Torture. We are greatly humbled by this award and by the courage of our clients, Suleiman Abdullah, Salim Mohammed Ahmed Ben Saud, and Obaidullah, who engage in a years-long effort to achieve justice. We are also grateful for our co-counsel, the Gibbons Law Firm, and for the important efforts of the anti-torture community since 9-11 to seek accountability and prevent a return to torture. I would also like to thank and recognize Stephen Watt, Dora Ladin, and Hina Shamsi, the ACLU attorneys who tirelessly worked on this case but could not be here this evening. The settlement achieved in this case is a historic victory for our brave clients and for the rule of law. It shows that there are consequences for torture and that survivors can and will hold those responsible for torture accountable, excuse me. It shows that there are consequences for torture and that survivors can and will hold those responsible for torture accountable. And it is a clear warning for anyone who thinks they can torture with impunity, including those advocates of torture currently serving in the Trump administration. Torture is about trying to break human beings. Torturers inflict suffering with the goal of making prisoners feel such overpowering fear and despair that they cannot resist the torturer's demands. Psychologists James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen specifically designed their torture program for the CIA to inflict fear and despair until prisoners became helpless. It takes a lot of courage for anyone who has been so brutally traumatized to stand up to those responsible. But that is what our clients did in seeking accountability in a U.S. court. They each flew thousands of miles to tell their stories. They endured depositions and medical exams, and they prevailed over every obstacle. No other case from the ACLU or colleague organizations on behalf of torture victims or survivors have, has ever come so far. To understand the legal landscape our clients face with this lawsuit, it's important to look back at the much longer story of torture accountability. That story, until today, has been one of total impunity. The Bush administration turned to torture just over 15 years ago, inflicting violence and suffering on hundreds of mostly brown and black Muslim men held in secret prisons around the world. In the years that followed, attorneys from the ACLU and partner organizations represented a number of survivors seeking accountability. But every case, without exception, ended the same way courts turn survivors away from the courthouse doors. Judges, 
refused even to consider the abuses that government officials and, contra and contractors acting in our name inflicted on our fellow human beings. In ruling after ruling, judges decided that the CIA's torture program was too secret for our courts, that the Constitution did not protect prisoners of the United States from torture, that torturers at Guantanamo were immune from liability, that government officials who justified and ordered the torture of a U.S. citizen were immune from liability, that contractors involved in torture could not be sued. It is a depressing litany of impunity. But Suleiman, Mohammed, and Obaidullah were not deterred. They insisted on telling their stories to the world. In doing so, through their lawsuit, they made an enormous amount of information public for the first time. Dozens of new documents detailing the torture program were unearthed in their case, and it forced former senior CIA officials, Jose Rodriguez and John Rizzo, in addition to Mitchell and Jessen themselves, to testify about torture during depositions. The groundbreaking revelations that ensued are a powerful reminder of what's possible when a few brave individuals rise up and speak truth to power. Torture is intended to break the minds and bodies of our fellow human beings. But the outcome of this case shows that it's possible to prevail against it. The anti-torture community is relentless, and today our clients are victorious. This is our message. We are watching. Thank you. I'm sorry, I've got to go. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jamie Mayerfeld, and I'm a professor of political science and um, a faculty associate of the Center for Human Rights here at the University of Washington. We have four uh, wonderful speakers uh, tonight. I will introduce them all together and then have them speak in turn. Our first speaker is John Kiriakou. Uh, John Kiriakou was a CIA analyst and case officer until 2004. He then became a senior investigator for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a counterterrorism consultant for ABC News, and an author. He was the first US government official to confirm in December 2007 that waterboarding was used to interrogate Al-Qaeda prisoners, which he described as torture. He also confirmed that torture was an official US government policy, rather than wrongdoing by a few rogue agents. In 2012, Kiriakou pleaded guilty to disclosing the identity of a fellow CIA officer. He was the first CIA officer to be convicted for passing classified information to a reporter, although the reporter did not publish the name of the operative. He was sentenced to 30 months in prison and served his term for almost two years. Since that time, Kiriakou has become a prolific journalist and commentator and is a columnist with reader-supported news. He resides in Washington, DC. Our next speaker will be Lisa Hajar, who is professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with courtesy appointments in the Global and International Studies and Middle East Studies departments. In 2014 to 2015, she was the Edward Said Chair of American Studies at the American University of Beirut. Her areas of expertise include sociology of law, law and society, international and global studies, and political sociology. Her research interests include human rights, international law, torture, war and conflict, uh, and war and conflict, especially in the Middle East. Professor Hajar is the author of Courting Conflict, the Israeli military court system in the West Bank and Gaza, and Torture, a sociology of violence and human rights. She is completing two additional books, one on human rights in the Arab world and another on anti-torture legal efforts in the post 9-11 period. She has authored dozens of articles on human rights and torture. Our next speaker will be Ron Steef. Uh, Ron Steef, an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, is the executive director of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, headquartered in Washington, DC. 
Reverend Steve speaks wi widely at college campuses, interfaith events, and coalition actions to end torture. He serves as the chair of the executive committee of Shoulder to Shoulder, Standing with American Muslims Upholding American Values. From 1999 to 2008, Reverend Steve was the director of the Washington DC office of the United Church of Christ, where he led advocacy efforts for its 5,500 congregations and 1.2 million members across the country on a broad range of domestic and international issues through both the UCC's Washington DC and United Nations offices. Our fourth speaker will be Rob Crawford, whom you have already met. Professor, uh, Rob Crawford is Professor Emeritus of the University of Washington Tacoma School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, where he was a founding faculty member and taught until his retirement last year. Among his many courses, he taught torture and human rights, post 9-11, culture and war. In 2007, he co-founded the Washington State Religious Campaign Against Torture and has facilitated the organization ever since. He has written articles on accountability for torture and many opinion editorials, the most recent appearing in the Seattle Times on September 4th. Uh, so just a brief round of applause for all of our speakers. Thank you. And our first speaker will be John Kiriakou. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. I have a very long story to tell, but I'm going to tell it in a very short way. Uh, I was a CIA officer for nearly 15 years, and in um, the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks, I found myself as the chief of CIA counterterrorism operations in Pakistan. Uh, it was in that uh, capacity that I led a series of raids in March of 2002 that resulted in the capture of Abu Zubaydah and several dozen other Al Qaeda fighters. Uh, we believed at the time that Abu Zubaydah was the number three uh, in Al Qaeda. That turned out to be uh, incorrect. He was not the number three in Al Qaeda. But the CIA was hungry for a scalp. Uh, Abu Zubaydah was the first one who stumbled onto our radar, and so we threw millions of dollars of, of resources uh, to look for him. We found him in an Al Qaeda safe house in Faisalabad, Pakistan. On the night of his capture, he was shot three times by a Pakistani policeman with an AK-47 in the thigh, the groin, and the stomach. Uh, wounds that would have killed just about anybody else, but he was young and strong and in great shape, and, and he pulled out of it. He was in a coma for the first 24 hours that we had him, and uh, my orders were to sit at his bedside and not to leave. I was afraid I would fall asleep, so I tore up a sheet and I tied him to the bed. The next day he woke up. Uh, he realized immediately that the Americans had him, and he panicked. But as he calmed down, I tried to engage him in conversation. And we talked about a lot of different things. He was very emotional. He cried a lot. Uh, he said he would never know the touch of a woman. He would never know the joy of fatherhood. Um, he recited poetry to me that he, had, that he had written. He didn't know we had confiscated his diary. We had the poetry. Uh, we compared Islam and Christianity. I found him actually to be quite intelligent, uh, quite talkative. And I said to him, listen, I'm going to give you a bit of advice. I am the nicest guy that you're going to meet in this experience. My colleagues are not as nice as I am. I said, I have no idea what the plans are for you, but if I can give you one bit of advice, it's that you have to cooperate. And he said, you seem like a nice man, but you're the enemy and I'll never cooperate. The next day, the CIA sent in a private jet to pick him up. On that jet was a contractor named James Mitchell. It's the second, it was the second time I had, I had seen uh, James Mitchell. I vaguely knew that he was a contractor. I vaguely knew that he had something to do with counterterrorism, 
but I had no idea what it was specifically that he was interested in. And I had no idea why he was on that flight. This was supposed to be one of the most highly classified operations that the CIA was conducting. And here's a contractor on the flight. And I remember being puzzled by that. Abu Zubaydah asked me to hold his hand while we carried him out to, uh, to the plane. Three FBI agents and I carried him out on a gurney, maneuvered him onto the plane, laid him across the luggage rack in the back, tied the luggage rack down, and I wished him the best of luck, and I shook his hand, and I never saw him again. About six weeks later, I returned to CIA headquarters, and I was in the cafeteria, and a senior officer in the CIA's counterterrorism center approached me and said, hey, I'm glad I ran into you. Uh, do you want to be certified in the use of enhanced interrogation techniques? I had never heard that term before. This was May of 2002. And I said, what's that mean? And very excitedly, he said, we're going to start getting rough with these guys. I said, well, what's that supposed to mean? And he delineated to me these 10 techniques that the CIA intended to begin using on Abu Zubaydah. And I said, that sounds like a torture program. Well, it's not torture, he said. The president approved it. And I said, nah, let me think about it. But I said, I, I have a moral problem with this. I went upstairs to the CIA's seventh floor, the executive floor. There was a very senior, very senior CIA officer there for whom I had worked in the Middle East about a decade earlier. And I knocked on his door and I said, I need some advice. I said, in the counterterrorism center, they just asked me if I wanted to be certified in these enhanced interrogation techniques. What do you think of this? I said, this sounds crazy to me. And he said, and he later denied that this conversation ever took place. But he said to me, first of all, let's call a spade a spade. This is a torture program. They can use whatever euphemism they want down there, but this is a, tor a torture program. And secondly, torture is a slippery slope. And you know how some of these guys are. Somebody's going to go overboard, and they're going to kill a prisoner. And when that happens, there's going to be a congressional investigation, and then there's going to be a Justice Department investigation, and somebody's going to go to prison. Do you want to go to prison? I said, no, I don't want to go to prison. As it turned out, I was the only one who went to prison. <laughs> But I said, no, I don't want to go to prison. I went back downstairs and I said, I think this is illegal, it's immoral, it's unethical, and I don't want any part of it. I'm, I'm sad to say that of the 14 people that they asked, I was the only one who said no. I'm still disappointed. In some of those 14, I considered them to be friends, and I thought that I knew them better than I did. Uh, within a couple of weeks, the CIA began torturing Abu Zubaydah. Uh, you've heard about most of the techniques. It started with an open-handed smack in the stomach. It makes a loud cracking sound. It frightens people. They did things like grab him by the lapels, and they were supposed to put a towel around his neck and slam him up against a plywood wall because plywood has a little bit of give, and the towel was supposed to protect his, his neck and the back of his skull. But they forgot the towel, and the wall was actually concrete. Uh, it got much worse very quickly. You've all heard of waterboarding. I won't waste our time on waterboarding. But there were techniques that I thought were worse than waterboarding, far worse in some cases. One was sleep deprivation. Uh, former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld famously said that he didn't believe sleep deprivation was torture because he would work. 24, sometimes 36 hours, and he had a stand-up desk in his office, and if he could do it, then these uh, Al-Qaeda terrorists could do it, and that's not torture. But we're not talking about 24 hours or 36 hours. We know from the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association that people begin to lose their minds around day seven without sleep. They begin to die at day nine. But the CIA was authorized to keep people awake for 12 days. 12 days. That's where you're chained to an eye bolt in the ceiling. So
so that you can't get comfortable. You can't sit. You can't lay. You have to stand. These industrial strength lights are on you 24 hours a day and hard rock is blasted into your cell. It's impossible to sleep. Of course you're going to lose your mind. There are prisoners at Guantanamo now who are unable to participate in their own defenses because they've lost their minds due to sleep deprivation. One that was in my view, even worse, was called the cold cell. The prisoner was chained into that, to that eye bolt in the ceiling again, stripped naked. The cell was chilled to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and every hour a CIA officer would enter the cell and throw a bucket of ice water on him. We killed people using that technique, but no one was ever brought to justice. And I ask you, what information is gathered when you kill someone? I mentioned earlier to, to uh, Rob here that I actually can understand the position of some CIA officers if they're told, don't worry about this, the Justice Department said it was legal and the President signed off on it. If they're true believers and they think that what they're doing is legal, okay, I understand not prosecuting them. But what about CIA officers who killed people in custody? There was no presidential order or Justice Department memo that said you can murder somebody while you're questioning him. The problem is one that's very, very basic. It's that there is literally no ethics training at the CIA. Now, a CIA psychiatrist once told me, I mentioned this earlier, that the CIA actively seeks to hire people who have sociopathic tendencies. Not sociopaths. Sociopaths have no conscience, and with no conscience, you can easily pass a polygraph exam. People who have sociopathic tendencies do have a conscience, but they're comfortable working in moral and legal gray areas. The problem is, if you have no conscience, you're going to pass that polygraph, and you're going to slip through the cracks. Well, psychopaths also have no conscience and can slip through the cracks. And any graduate level business school will tell you that people who rise up to the top of large organizations tend to be psychopaths. Well, if this psychopath has a top secret sensitive compartmented information security clearance and finds himself as the director of the CIA's uh, counterterrorism center, you can put two and two together. I'd like to ask a question, actually, just to sort of give you a real life example of how things work at the CIA. And I, I honestly would like to see a show of hands. So let's say you are all CIA case officers and you have recruited a member of a terrorist group, a bona fide terrorist group, Al Qaeda, ISIS, it can be whatever you want it to be. And you're going to meet this person in a hotel. Let's say it's in Cairo or Amman or someplace. And this guy has given you gold since you recruited him. And his information you've been able to use to actually disrupt terrorist attacks against American citizens. So you meet with him one night in this hotel and he says to you, listen, I've given you everything that you've asked me for. Everything I've told you is true. Now you're going to do something for me. And I'm not going to give you any more information until you go out there and you get me a prostitute. How many of you would get him the prostitute? Yeah, you would. It's your job. I mean, your job is to deal with people like this. So, sure, you'd get him the prostitute. What if he asks you for a child prostitute? Absolutely not, under any circumstances. But the problem is, there are no rules, right? There's no training to tell you what to do in a situation like this. There's nobody at any level that's going to say, listen, that, that this is just wrong. This is morally wrong. Because your job is to get the information. And if your job as a case officer is to break the laws of the country that you're assigned to, but you're going to break this law and not that law? So when you enter into the CIA, you have to have your own set of moral values. You have to have your own personal ethical structure. If you don't, what's to stop you from becoming a monster? And that's what happened after 9-11. Now, I'm supposed to talk about what dissenters um, do internally in a situation like this. I went to prison because 
uh, I blew the whistle on the CIA's torture program. Uh, I had no one to tell but the press. I couldn't go through the chain of command because my chain of command created the torture program. I couldn't go to the general counsel because the general counsel was complicit in the creation of the torture program. I couldn't go to the congressional oversight committees because they had secretly authorized the torture program. So you have a choice. You can either keep your mouth shut, which 99.9% .9 of people do, or you can go to the press. And my wife and I, my wife was a senior CIA officer who was fired from the CIA the day of my arrest only because she was married to me. We had a conversation. And I said, what do I do? And she said, you have to do what you think is right. And so I called Brian Ross at ABC News and I told him everything. So the boom was lowered. I went to prison for two years. But you know what? It was worth it. One of the things that's a, a, a deep regret of mine um, is the Senate torture report. The Senate torture report was published, at least the executive, the heavily redacted executive summary of the Senate torture report was published about six weeks before I, I came home from prison. And I happened to call my wife that day. And um, I said, how are you doing? And she said, I am doing great. It's been a great day. And I said, yeah, why? And she said, because the Senate torture report was released today and it proved that everything you said was true. I had no idea the Senate torture report had been released. But I finally got a copy of it, in prison still. And it was clear that there were people inside the CIA who were involved in this program, some of them in the secret site, who were objecting internally. But the regret that I mentioned a minute ago was that absolutely none of them said anything. None of them. In the end, it was worth it. The price was high, not just because I lost my freedom, but the government took my pension on top of it after 20 years of government service. Uh, but I can sleep at night. I'm going to close with one short anecdote. Jose Rodriguez is one of the true bad guys in this whole story. He was not just the director of the CIA's counterterrorism center. He went on to become the deputy director of the, of the CIA for operations and was really the godfather of this program from the very beginning. Three days before I went to prison, he tweeted at me and he said, don't drop the soap, asshole. Yeah, can you imagine that? I gave myself an hour to calm down because my normal reaction, well, you, you don't even want to know my normal reaction. So I calmed down and I tweeted back and I said, Jose, I'm on the right side of history and you are not. And I left it at that. And you know, as time passes, I think the country has come to the realization that, that we're all on the right side of history here. We're the ones who are right and they are wrong. And we have the wherewithal to keep talking about this. I mentioned earlier tonight that the reason why so many former CIA senior officers, directors and deputy directors continue this mantra that torture worked, which is a red herring anyway, whether it works or not is irrelevant. Whether it's right or wrong is the relevant issue. But their, their mantra is that torture worked. And it's because that is their legacy. When they die and their obituaries are written, those obituaries are going to say that they were instrumental in the creation and implementation of a torture program in violation of U.S. and international law, a torture program. And so they have committed themselves to repeating this lie over and over and over again with the hope that if they keep repeating it enough, Americans will believe it. Our job is to make sure that Americans don't believe it because we're right and they're wrong. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be here. I'm very grateful for the organizers. And it's also an honor to follow John Kiriakou. That was a great talk. Um, you know, one of the things I would just start off with, and the fact that we're in this room, there's a number of organizations here that are devoted. They were established to fight torture. The fact that there is an anti-torture community in America <laughs> is both wonderful and terrible. You know, it's a terrible thing that we are here. And I, the only point I would say was, I was doing torture back before it was cool. Like I was doing torture in the 90s. So in the sense that we have to be here, it's good that the, so many people have come together to really address this thing. I want to just start, you know, because so much of our thinking about torture is very much centered on the post 9-11 era and the debates that have gone on. But I just want to, just as a starting point, just really talk for a moment about what what is the importance of torture in a much broader, much deeper historical perspective? I mean, the relationship between torture and the law. You know, torture was, you know, in in much of Western, um, you know, uh, Europe was legal and necessary in the law. And it was only at a particular moment, kind of one of those enlightenment moments, when torture, the, lo the law of torture was changed in order to prevent what had previously been deemed legal and necessary. And three elements of that um, pro the, 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 the cleansing of the law of the right to torture are absolutely elemental to three things that are crucial to pub, you know modern civilizations one is simply the rule of law itself you know the rule of law as we understand it is literally built the cornerstone of the rule of law is the um, you know cleansing of the law of the right to perpetrate violence against people in custody the the second um, important element of this history of torture is that once it was written out of the law by limiting the, what states or governments can do to people when they're at their most vulnerable, imposing legal limits on states was a major phenomenon in modern legal liberalism. And the third element is by preventing torture, by, by saying that it's not okay to purposefully harm people in custody, it was literally one of the first steps to turn people into humans, to, to turn people into humans who have inviolable rights. And I've always, you know, sort of said back when I was doing torture before all the rest of you people were doing torture, was, or thinking about it, was that it really is the most important and the most universal human right that we have. All human rights are important, but what is so significant about the right Right not to be tortured is that it is an absolute right. It applies to all people everywhere under all circumstances. You don't have to be a good person not to have the right not to be tortured. You just have to be a person. And so that significance of the right not to be tortured in its relationship to the rule of law, its relationship to the limits on the powers of the state is absolutely essential. And so violating that right doesn't just harm the victims. You know, it literally harms the law. It harms civilization. It harms the principles of humanity. I mean, it degrades many of the things that we thought we might be, you know, sort of, especially in this country, the champions of. And I would also just mention that torture, in its context in the law, if we now fast forward to the 20th century and the 21st century, tortures partners in the law are genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So when people in this country blithely, you know, excuse or justify or embrace or applaud torture, it's, it behooves us to remember that they could be literally behooving genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity because all four of those specific categories are the, what are called gross violations under international law. And they are all absolutely and categorically prohibited by the law. Um, and so it just, you know, the prohibition of torture is, and its criminality are customary international law. So if every human being everywhere on earth has a right not to be tortured legally, that means there's absolutely no human being on earth has a right to torture. And anyone who is engaged in or abetted torture is and should be made vulnerable to the law. The law should be, you know, we should be on the side of the law that wants to prosecute people. I mean, you know, and that's an essential um, element. So I just want to note for a moment the, you know, um, thinking about 
um, what the law does in this context. We're thinking about torture as a crime. I, sometimes I like to cite the work of the late Robert Cover, who was a law professor and philosopher at Yale. And he was, um, he was the guy who really gave, uh, created in a sense in the 1980s and 90s, an appreciation for the violence of law. Um, and he's, you know, he's been credited for ushering in and laying the ground for what was, what's been termed like a jurisprudence of violence. And one of his famous quotes was, legal interpretation takes place on a field of pain and death. He was talking about the violence of the law, law enforcement. I mean, John Kiriakou has experienced the violence of the law. But when, I, when we're thinking about these kinds of gross human rights violations, I'm a, a strong enthusiast for the violence of the law when it comes to the prosecution of people who are accused of uh, gross violations of, the, of human rights and international law. And in that sense, you know, I sort of sometimes stand outside the narrative of many of my progressive friends, intellectuals, and others who are, you know, devoted to politically, um, politically committed to progressive causes and protecting rights. But many progressives are fundamentally uncomfortable with violence and even legal violence. And they want to see themselves and their cause as rejoinders to violence. And that's a good thing. But I believe that Robert Covered was right. The law is violent, even if that um, violence is antiseptically termed legitimate force. And so I see a progressive cause. Maybe it's not everybody's cup of tea, but every, you know, it is, there's a progressive cause in t developing a, what I call a perpetrator-centered perspective, like looking for perpetrators and looking to do legal violence to them. So not sort of get your violence on. Um, I mean, I'm a you know, big enthusiast for that kind of thinking in terms of when it comes to prosecuting uh, agents of the state and other officials who engage in torture, war crimes, crimes against humanity, et cetera. Now, there are a number of ways in which count accountability can be um, pursued. And as the ACLU uh, who representative who uh, very eloquently talked about the many doors that have been closed uh, on accountability in this country until the precedential uh, civil case of Jessene Mitchell. But if we think more broadly, I mean, torture is an international crime. And among the ways in which people who can be, there's no, um, there's no statute of limitations for the crime of torture. And so if you think about how do you get these guys, you know, some of them are still young. Some of them are still out there. Some of them are still teaching law at Berkeley. Um, you know, there are, you know, <laughs> there are ways of thinking about this, you know. So one of the, um, you know, I mean, obviously the violations of the Geneva Conventions, you know, torture is a violation of the Geneva Conventions, therefore it's a war crime. Now. The law itself, what happened in the United States after 9-11 was that at, with the advisement of right-wing lawyers um, cooperating with political officials who felt wanted to torture, they wanted to torture, they felt they, they deluded themselves into thinking that torture was a necessary and legitimate strategy, they offered up legal reasonings, including, for example, President Bush on February 7th, 2002, was heavily advised by these lawyers and by Dick Cheney to declare the Geneva Conventions inapplicable to the war on terror. And this primary purpose of that declaration was to shield officials from the prospect of future prosecutions. And as we know what happened, you know, fast forward to Obama, uh, Obama never pursued accountability on the grounds that the law in this country had been so tainted by these ridiculous, contrary to rationality interpretations, but nevertheless, they were official interpretations, and it makes it very difficult to prosecute um, people in this country, particularly government officials. But there is, you know, um, uh, one thing we could say is that the universe, the, the doctrine of universal jurisdiction. That remains a relevant uh, criminal international law doctrine. And it's the one, what the universal um, uh, jurisdiction means is that some crimes are so extreme that their perpetrators are enemies of all mankind. That's what it is. And so the, in the modern, in the contemporary era, Torturers, war criminals, uh, genocidaires, and those responsible for crimes against humanity are enemies of all mankind because those crimes are regarded as menacing humanity itself. And what that means is that if a person is not prosecuted in his or her own jurisdiction, he or she can be prosecuted anywhere in the world.
And so the cases that have been pursued, although so far unsuccessfully for the most part in Europe, have operationalized the universal jurisdiction doctrine. But Obama, the Obama administration, very much uh, thwarted uh, the possibility for justice in, um, uh, in, in European courts. But because there is, no, uh, there is no statute of limitations, it's still possible to get these people. You know, and I mean, I would say that one of the things we can learn from the example of Latin America, where you know, during the dirty wars, you know, horrific crimes were perpetrated. And then there was, for the most part, impunity, immunity and impunity for about 20 years. Two things that mattered then and now was that the fact that there were, I mean, really human rights activism began as we now think of it in Latin America, in South Africa, in the occupied Palestinian territories, in the places where governments were perpetrating some of the worst violence. And those human rights activists who took, uh, you know, took positions in the 70s, the 1970s against human rights violations and made the use of international law, they were the ones who, the first people who brought international law down to the streets and out into the sort of public domain, didn't really have much of an effect in Latin America, but time passes. And as we know, you know, over time, it was the fact that human rights um, activists had taken note and documented and protested back in the 70s and 80s and the passage of time and the possibility of then in the 90s and 2000s going after those aging military dictators and, and uh, torturers from Latin America. So even if people are feeling depressed about what has happened or the possibilities of justice now, you know, just remember that, that the, the work that people are doing now, the organizations, this will be be important in the future, um, I think. So I would just sort of conclude with just a couple of things about the issue of domestic um, unaccountability. I mean, not prosecuting torturers makes a mockery of the law itself. And that's something that, you know, as we have our partisan debates and as 72% of Republicans when polled are now support torture and whatever the kinds of debates, they've become so um, void of both the deeper significance historically and legally, and they're really just a partisan issue. You know, I mean, it's, it's so, it's really sort of minimized these issues, these points. But it's important for you know, people like us and people who we come in contact with to really keep on pressing the point of accountability. And as um, John Kiriakou had mentioned, I mean, the Senate Select Committee on um, Intelligence, which is inaccessible to us, you know, but for the heavily redacted executive summary, um, it contains our nation's history. You know, it contains our nation's history. And the fact that some people, you know, in Congress would have wanted to um, destroy every copy is disgusting. You're destroying our history. It's a disgusting chapter of our history, but it's our history. But then Obama saved our history, albeit in the most namby pamby way possible. He put it, he preserved one copy of this document of our grotesque history of torture in his presidential archives, but he said nobody can access it for the longest amount of time, you know, available by law. But the point is that we have to keep on understanding, even from the information that we have, what this country did, and that accountability is important and, you know, something to continue being activists about. I mean, the little we know, I mean, we know a lot from the executive summary, but one of the things we know, you know, is that aside from just torture, I mean, torture is almost, as I've sort of suggested, it's become so commonplace in American, you know, uh, vernacular, but it was also also involved human experimentation. So it's important to invoke that term, like the CIA engaged in human experimentation. And if that gives, brings to mind Nazis, that's exactly the point. By shielding you know, CIA officials from the, the, the rules and norms of law that were established because of the Nazis, we are back you know, in a place where this is something our history uh, resembles a Nazi history, you know, and, and, and it disregards the um, 
the safety mechanisms that were instituted after the Holocaust about not being able to experiment on human beings. And so, you know, information, you know, becomes absolutely crucial. I want to, you know, sort of commend, you know, in terms of bringing to the public the attention of these issues, obviously John Kiriakou, obviously Chelsea Manning, um, and other people who have helped the public see what the government does not want uh, us to see, which is, you know, information about crimes. Right, this is information about crimes, and the criminality of it is um, something that it's worth keeping in mind. So I want to really commend the ACLU for their uh, precedent in the um, Mitchell and Jessen uh, settlement, although I really would have liked to have the court, uh, have the trial take place. I was bummed, I had a ticket for Spokane and everything. But I would just mention that that was the precedent and now there's a second case that is at least gonna be moving forward. It hasn't been dismissed. It's the Al Shamari um, versus Katchi case. This case has been litigated by the Center for Constitutional Rights for nine years. Um, it's basically, uh, you know, in America, you can't have criminal cases unless the government's on your side. So it's a civil case involving survivors from Abu Ghraib prison suing the contractors. Again, it's also contractors, not officials, but the contractors from the firm CACCI. Um, so this is another case that perhaps it's re just to reiterate, it remains important for us to care, for us to, you know, listen to people who have information to tell us um, and to, you know, have some faith that the changing political environment uh, will come uh, at some point. And so I would just say the history of this era that we're living in, it's defined both by torture and by transnational efforts to, to uh, anti-torture efforts to stop and punishment. And so even failed efforts to pursue accountability um, now, uh, they leave a noble record of efforts to enforce the law and validate the norms and rules that were so flagrantly violated. And these initiatives, I believe, will be important in the future, perhaps even more than in the present, um, because they stand as a record of resistance to dehumanization and as any good student of uh, law knows, law in action knows, the impact of legal initiatives can never be judged by the immediate outcome of cases. So thank you all for your work. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. That was great. Um, Reverend Ron Steef again, uh, United Church of Christ, the director of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Um, one thing I just noted looking at my notes was, uh, you know, if you have a huckleberry stain on your notes, you're really in the right place at the right time. Uh, I got some wild huckleberries and they, some of it ended up on my... Uh, it is, yeah, right, they're all over out here. Yeah, the, um, so, so thanks everybody for being here. Um, we are a national coalition that formed about 11 years ago to bring the moral voice more explicitly into the work uh, against torture. And not that that moral voice isn't there with all the great organizations like ACLU, Human Rights Watch, et cetera, many of the sponsors that are here at this event. Um, not that it isn't there, but this brings the religious community uh, into the fight in a way that wasn't happening uh, before we were formed. And so uh, that's where the National Religious Campaign Against Torture came on the scene and we have about 320 organizations across the country, um, many local congregations, many uh, orders of sisters and Catholic brothers, uh, uh, mashids, uh, very interfaith, uh, synagogues, local synagogues, local associations, and we have the Washington State Religious Campaign Against Torture. And I want to give them a huge applause for bringing this to the forefront at an incredibly critical time when this trial was hitting, hitting this state. So, yeah, no. <clears throat> Um, I mean, just one of many, and I'm, I'm here to talk about the role of the, the faith community in the grassroots organizing and the organizing of the resistance that's happening across the country kind of over this time, but also I want to say a little bit about what we're doing in Washington, D.C. right now in the Trump administration to put up the resistance of uh, the faith community, ACLU, all of us working together on that. So um, if you're interested in that, I hope you are. Uh, if not, you only have to put up with me for about another 13 minutes. So. Um, um, 
But you know, and I'm going to expand the definition a little bit because we also work on the torture of solitary confinement in U.S. prisons, which affects about 80 to 100,000 people uh, at any given moment. And the same thing that happens to the minds of folks that are in situations of torture that John described is happening every day in in our state federal prisons and jails. And I'm also going to talk about the bigotry against Muslims, which is part of what makes, uh, I, we believe in this, at least the post 9-11 era, makes uh, the possibility for how many, uh, all of your colleagues to say, yeah, sign me up, because there is bigotry against the Muslim world and the Muslim community and Muslim individuals. So those are the three kind of key areas that we work on, and they're very related. But, you know, just like the Washington State Religious Campaign just jumped uh, into the middle of making sure that uh, everybody in Washington State and then uh, the New York Times was making sure everybody across the country knew how important this trial was in Spokane as a kind of a, a, a hearing on, on showing what really happens in torture. We, it's happening over and over around the country. Three years ago when a, uh, the state of Alabama had a anti-foreign law bill which was a, a ballot amendment on anti sharia basically it was an anti-Muslim ballot amendment uh, one of our, our campaign coalitions there brought the Christian coalition in to take it on as a state issue a very conservative uh, organization as you know took that issue on that ballot initiative on and said no this is wrong we can't continue to target the Muslim community in this way when the uh, prisoners uh, when 30,000 uh, prisoners started by prisoners in Pelican Bay and other solitary confinement unions units in the state of California went on a hunger strike. 30,000 prisoners coordinated a hunger strike on the conditions of torture that are happening in solitary confinement in the state of California. Uh, American Friends Service Committee, a lot of the faith groups, a lot of us, we all jumped in and of course the Center for Constitutional Rights had a classic, uh, a, a, an amazing win, uh, raising the human rights issues and, and helping to close down a significant part of the Pelican Bay, uh, like one of the, wor one of the worst torture uh, chambers we have in this country of solitary confinement. So the folks have been there. When uh, Mike Pompeo was uh, uh, named to be the nominee for the CIA, um, right before his nomination hearing, we had a, a group that's associated with NERCAT, a group of nuns in Wichita. Wichita is his home district. He's a, he was a former member of Congress. The nuns took television cameras in and we delivered 3,000 names of people in Kansas who said torture is immoral. There's no place for torture in this country. You know, brought the cameras in, got articles in the paper. Uh, we, we delivered that same message uh, to the uh, committee that was hearing, uh, that, that was, that was uh, um, looking at his nomination and you know, eventually they passed him in. So over and over and over again, every year on January 11th, uh, this will be the 16th year now to close Guantanamo. It's an international, uh, uh, solidarity action to call for the closure of Guant Guantanamo. We always have a huge group in front of the White House and I'm hoping that you'll have one here this year because the faith community and the and the organizers and God bless everybody who's here we are standing up against torture and making this visible as an issue that uh, is a moral issue and one that has no place in this society. Um, so I mean I could I could go on and on even even on uh, when uh, 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 Richard Burr, the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, when he first came in, when the, when, when the Republicans gained control of all the committees, we delivered a petition of uh, four or 5,000 names to him saying, we don't want you to bury that torture report because that's what he was threatening to do, just take it and get rid of it and erase it. So grassroots activism, whether it's in North Carolina, Seattle, Wichita, all across the country, we're standing up and doing something about this. And I don't know about you, but that gives me a tremendous amount of hope. And I guess I will say one more thing about the moral voice against torture because it's important. Uh, in, in our coalitions, we play as the faith community a very important role because we don't care for the arguments about whether it works or whether it doesn't work. 
That makes no difference to us. This really is one of those moral absolutes that uh, the entire faith community agrees on, that torture is immoral in any situation. Uh, don't catch me up in the debate about whether it works or not. Don't catch me up in the debate that our president tries to put out there about what you should do to punish people who do bad things. Forget about trying to get intelligence from them. That, there's no place for this in our society. Torture is absolutely wrong and there's no place for it in any society. So that's where we come across on the, on the moral issues and it's very important that there's groups in the mix that can say that because not every group can say that that we work with in coalition. So um, that's where we stand. Um, and so here we have a president who was quoted in, in as he campaigned in saying that um, even if torture doesn't work, they deserve it anyway for what they're doing. So now we're in Washington, D.C., and we're working against that, that kind of a backdrop. Um, in January 27th, when the administration either floated a trial balloon or leaked or something, a plan which really specifically uh, call would have called for uh, reopening the CIA uh, black site prisons again and questioning kind of what we had accomplished by getting the whole McCain-Feinstein bill passed which codified Obama's executive order which which kept the CIA out of the torture business w was going to look at that. Uh, it was kind of leaked out there and there was a huge response that came back. It wasn't as big as I would have liked to but importantly McCain wasn't just causing trouble uh, now with the health care crisis, he, he started causing trouble right there. He said, un, he didn't quite say over my, you know, whatever. I, I don't know exactly how he said it, but it was basically like, as long as I'm standing here, there's no way we're going to go back and undo the legislation that codifies this torture. So that, that started to happen, you know, the pushback. We've pushed back, uh, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and a lot of groups pushed back on all of the Trump cabinet nominations uh, and the CIA nomination uh, when they came up in January and February. We had uh, in-district phone calls happening uh, to about 11 of the Republican members of the, the uh, committees that were hearing them, Defense, uh, State Department, uh, or you know, the, the, uh, uh, the position for Homeland Security. Those who, tried, who were nominated to be in those positions were getting uh, 250 phone calls from their home states over the course of, of two days. The Republican senators were getting call, phone calls saying, don't let them uh, wiggle away from torture. Ask them about torture and, and let them know that torture is wrong. And so each one of them actually was asked about torture and each one of them did have to say, yes, I realize that it is the law of the land uh, after McCain-Feinstein that, that we can't do torture. And I even heard Mike Pompeo, the now head of the CIA, who's really a pretty big fan of torture, uh, come out and say that if Trump told him to go torture somebody, no, he would, he, he would have, you know, he couldn't do that because it's, it's not legal. So we've made some good progress, but we're really kind of hanging on to the edge of the cliff with our fingers, too. Um, there's, a, there's another case that we're working on now, uh, Stephen Bradbury, which was a lawyer. I mean, these folks could tell you all kinds of things about Stephen Bradbury, but he was basically one of the lawyers who wrote the torture memo, the, the, wrote the torture memos that basically helped permit the kind of torture that John was talking about. Um, he is now up for a, a general counsel position with the Department of Transportation. Uh, we've run uh, phone call campaigns, credo, demand progress, national organizations, national religious campaign against torture. We have run campaigns uh, on him, uh, reminding the U.S. Senate that this is somebody who authored torture memos, who let torture happen, and he shouldn't get any position in government. So the, the idea, it's, it's a weird form of accountability. I wish we really could do some legal accountability, and I believe, like Lisa said, that day will come. But while we're out there, we're continuing to remind people of how wrong what these individuals did. Now, he's here he's going for Department of Transportation. I, I don't think they tra torture people. I mean, who knows? Maybe they'll start, but I don't think they will. 
but it's following him. His record's following him. We're not going to let people get away with what they did. If, they if there's no legal accountability, there's going to be community accountability. And so that's, those, those are the kind of things that I think we're really doing. I would say our end game with the Trump administration, there's two ways that this can go. Um, at one level, what we're doing right now, all this organizing, and I could name a lot more in a lot of different places and states, all this organizing at one level is to keep us together raising the issues in case the unthinkable could happen. That could be another war, another major 9-11 style uh, uh, terrorist attack here in our country, whatever it might be that might f flare this back up. We're keeping ourselves ready for that point. And what I hope is going to happen is that if we can get through this Trump administration without a significant effort, a uh, successful effort on their part, at least as far as what we know happens, you don't always know what, everything that happens when you come to groups like the CIA, but if there's no kind of public backtracking on torture and Trump is the president, if we can hold the line for another three years, we really do believe that we have kind of made it through a period where uh, no one will be able to, again, make a credible case that the United States should return to a policy of torturing people. So those are kind of like the two scenarios and realities that we're, that we're trying to hang on to in our work. Much of our work is, is uh, aimed at the United States Senate. Uh, and um, for example, in the Bradbury case, uh, Senator uh, Schumer and the Democrats kept Bradbury. I mean, you would think they would say, oh, come on, you know, look. Forget about it. We got more important things to think about. They kept Bradbury from getting put in a basically an omnibus bunch of nominations that, that had just been held up that was supposed to happen uh, right before they went on break, uh, their summer break. It didn't happen. Um, it, this is Commerce Committee. They're talking about torture in the Commerce Committee. They stopped that, and Bradbury still doesn't have his position. So there's, uh, we're also, that's my point of working with the Senate, we're also trying to really uh, continue to support and bring this voice to the senators because they do have an important role in whether, whether we have this attack or in holding uh, President Trump, Trump and others uh, back from reinstituting any s sort of a torture program. So I'll end there and, and, uh, and put it over to uh, Rob because I know he's going to be able to kind of wrap this all up. But just let me again say thank you to those of you who are in this room and, and really remember um, like when this trial came out here, the reason we as a national organization, although we're a national network, wanted to make as much noise as we could about it uh, was not because we are a national group that works on torture, but because if people ever think that the reason we're not torturing folks is because there's this group of policy wonks in Washington, D.C. who don't want us to torture people. If anybody ever starts thinking that, that's it. We've lost. We'll never be able to get what we want. So this grassroots work that you all are doing here, continue to do. I hope you have a great event on January 11th, uh, standing up to try to get Guantanamo closed. That's another big piece of what we need to be addressing. And I just want to thank everybody who's come here. You, you're, None of this, none of what I'm talking about would be possible without you. So thank you. Thank you, Ron. We will organize an event around January 11th. If you're on our list, you'll hear about it. My task uh, this evening is to address the question of resistance to torture at the grassroots. The grass, grassroots movements are the engine of social change. They destabilize the status quo. They disrupt the ruler's expectations of quiescence among the ruled. They are the one place where normally passive people become active and demand a more just society. Organizing from the ground up with this ever-present threat of turning into a mass movement is always dangerous. Grassroots movements keep alive the spirit of resistance 
and build community and solidarity through collective action. They provide the public with a radically different way to understand the political moment. An understanding informed by the experience of responding to that moment. This has been my experience with the grassroots anti-torture movement. Not to imply that grassroots organizing ever stands alone. Local action is made possible by the example of others who preceded it and the example of contemporary movements fighting in other arenas against injustices. They are also thickly interwoven with the work of national and international organizations working on the same issues by the legal challenges brought by organizations like the ACLU or CCR or in Washington State by our own Attorney General. They are given energy and critical information by the courage of those on the inside who dissent and go public with what they know. Not least, they depend on independent investigative journalists and dissenting researchers in universities. From its beginning in 2007, the Washington State Religious Campaign Against Torture was influenced by the early efforts of national human rights organizations which were already mobilizing resistance to the Bush-Cheney torture regime. We were already informed by the pioneering investigative journalists such as Jane Mayer, Dana Priest, Scott Shane, Charlie Savage, Seymour Hirsch, Stephen Gray in the UK. We were encouraged by members of Congress who attempted and achieved partial legislative successes and who later launched important investigations in the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee. We also witnessed the amazing legal resistance that was being mounted by what came to be known as the Gitmo Bar. We had not yet heard of the early dissenters at Guantanamo who leaked information to lawyers, or we had not heard yet about Alberto Mora, the former general counsel of the Navy, who stood up to Rumsfeld in an attempt to stop torture at Guantanamo. Yet, we celebrated the courage of Joseph Darby at Abu Ghraib, and then General Antonio Taguba for refusing to be cowed in his investigation of the Abu Ghraib scandal. Taguba later wrote, quote, there is no longer any doubt that the current administration committed war crimes. The only question is whether those who ordered torture will be held accountable. This from a U.S. general. And of course we recognize the importance of John Kiriakou, who conveyed the truth of CIA torture, the waterboarding when it was still being denied, and who paid dearly for it. Not least, Wissercat, as we call ourselves, drew upon the National Religious Campaign Against Torture as a model and an inspiration for our local work. NARCAT provided us with resources and information and with knowledge that we were part of a nationwide movement. NARCAT helped shape our early actions, such as our successful banner campaign as part of our demand for an executive order from the new president in 2009. 23 congregations in the Seattle area put up banners on the outside of their buildings. This is what grassroots organizing looks like. Through our 10 years of anti-torture activism, we gave talks and workshops in congregations at events like MLK Day at Garfield High, events at UW. We organized public events with prominent speakers recruited from around the country. We held vigils, rallies, news conferences. We gathered petitions at public events, and of course, we sent out dozens online. We wrote opinion editorials, letters, letters to the editor, we visited our congressional representatives and pressed them to take legislative action. In all of this, we reached out to other peace and justice organizations and formed working coalitions. Just look at the co-sponsors of tonight's event as an example, including our new alliance with Spokane activists. There are other examples of grassroots resistance to torture that I wish I had time to tell you about such as Witness Against Torture in Washington, D.C., 
which has fo focused its work on Guantanamo with dramatic protests of civil disobedience at the White House and the Supreme Court. I would refer you to the several local affiliates of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and to the extraordinary work of the North Carolina Stop, Stop Torture Now group that has been working for more than a decade to bring accountability to the Aero Corporation based in North Carolina which flew up to a third of the rendition flights for the CIA. One of the interesting features of that organizing was the local component just as the projected trial in Spokane was a local hook for us these past few months. I would also refer you to the movements to end solitary confinement that Ron spoke about and other abuses in U.S. prisons. Just as we trust that our work now will shape the future, we also recognize how the past has shaped us. The people who do the work at the Washington State Religious Campaign were all formed by our opposition to war. We came all the way from the protests against the Vietnam War, the first and second Iraq wars, and the endless wars of post 9-11. We came from the Fellowship of Reconciliation, from, from Pax Christi, from Ground Zero, from peace and justice groups within congregations and other anti-war organizations. We came from our teaching about war and human rights, from the UW Center for Human Rights and other human rights organizations. In other words, we came to our anti-torture activism with an understanding that post 9-11 war served agendas that were hidden from the public by the politics of fear and the justifications that regime change and occupation would bring democracy, human rights, and the rule of law to the occupied. The Abu, Abu Ghraib's torture scandal brought home to us and made gruesomely apparent the massive contradiction between the inhuman reality of war and the values that are proclaimed by our leaders. No longer could the pretense of defending human rights stand. At that point, anti-war activism became anti-torture activism. When we spoke to others, we found immediate recognition of the grave injustice of torture and for, and for most people, its connection to war. It is true. Many churches and synagogues avoided the moral confrontation. Their pastors and rabbis fearful of internal dissension. So it has always been. But many others recognize that torture is a weapon of war that terrorizes its helpless victims and their communities. Many were also quick to recognize that contrary to the claims of its proponents, Torture actually undermines our national security. Terrorist recruiters welcome those who sought revenge for torture. High-ranking military officers have estimated that Abu Ghraib accounted for more deaths and injuries of US soldiers in Iraq than any other single factor. This must be a part of the history that we tell about the Iraq war, the other wars, and about the terrorist threat that we now face. I turn now to some brief, brief reflections on our current political crisis and the place of anti-torture activism in the resistance. The most obvious threat comes from the president, who during the campaign and even after taking office called for bringing back torture. We need to take these threats seriously. <clears throat> Trump's appointment of torture proponents to high positions, and even a woman, Gina Haspel, who operated a black site to become deputy director of the CIA. And we could say a lot about the director, Mr. Pompeo, as well. There is more. The rhetoric of torture plays a crucial part in the language of violence that Trump has put at the forefront of his politics. 
It is a rhetoric that is aimed at both internal and external enemies. And there is much that needs to be said about this politics of violence, both rhetorical and real. My point is that torture is the perfect metaphor for this more generalized violence against antagonists now called enemies. As Lisa brought to our attention, we should not forget that torture, like slavery, genocide, war crimes, lies at the very heart of the modern liberal order of human rights. The effort to limit the arbitrary power of governments to do as they will to enemies and scapegoats. The human rights movement aims to create a political culture that rejects the claimed right of the sovereign to stop at nothing, to stop at nothing against those it defines as enemies. I submit that our grassroots responsibility to resist torture is no less than this. Beyond the core struggle, if that weren't enough, I believe that torture also expresses an even darker force that cannot be ignored. The enthusiastic or, insip or simply the cold-hearted embrace of violence inflicted on an enemy that cannot resist, who is helpless before power and who will be tortured for the hell of it. Isn't this the meaning of Trump's statement that even if it doesn't work, they deserve it anyway? Violence for the sake of retribution, violence as punishment, violence as the calculated application of pain until the victim pleads for it to stop and not even then. Not least, violence as the belligerent assertion of nationalist prerogative in both the domestic and global arenas. Thus, when I imagine grassroots resistance to torture in the past, in the present, and the future, I imagine loudly opposing the burgeoning rhetoric and acts of violence that Trump has both unleashed and sanctioned. I imagine Trump's torture rhetoric as, rhetoric as one in the same as his threat to completely destroy North Korea to take out families of terrorists, to encourage police violence, to threaten to build walls, deport millions, and punish sanctuary cities, ban Muslim visitors and immigrants, and close American, American shores to refugees. Torture rhetoric is one and the same as the decision to lift human rights restrictions for the military to give free reign to commanders in the field, and to push for an even bigger, life-destroying military budget that already exceeds the, expendit the expenditures of the next eight countries combined. Finally, isn't the demand for accountability for torture one and the same as the demand for accountability for each of these unjust policies, past and present? The road toward achieving government, a government that is accountable to the, peop uh, to the people is a long road indeed. It will not come from the powers that, will be, the powers that be. It will not descend on us from elsewhere. Accountability belongs to the grassroots. It will be the grassroots, each of us together, that will take on the moral and the political responsibility to resist torture and all state violence, along with the violence of the growing white supremacist movement with which torture keeps company. I thank you, Seattle. I thank you for your participation in the grassroots. You are the grassroots, and we are not going to go away. Thank you. I want to thank uh, all of our speakers for, for uh, a set of really wise and thought-provoking um, presentations. I'm really grateful. I learned a lot, and I'm sure um, the rest of you uh, learned a lot as well. Uh, we now have time for uh, questions from the audience. Um, so I'll ask uh, audience members to state questions or comments. Uh, it's possible the panelists have
thoughts in response to each other's presentations, but maybe you can fold that into to your responses to audience members. Um, oh, so they, okay. So I would ask that you come up to uh, microphones so that, um, that people can hear your questions. Hi, it's more of a comment. Um, torture is not about getting information. The, co the centerpiece of torture is getting control. It's about power and it's about destruction. So the reason for torture is never gaining information. It's kind of side effect. And this entire uh, discussion about whether or not information you get is real or it's imagined or it's whatever is just irrelevant because the point of tor torture is to gain control to assert power over an in individual. And the first step towards a society that allows torture is basically uh, disenfranchising people, uh, target groups, and um, dehumanizing them. Because if your target is less human than you are, then whatever you do to that person is no longer a problem. And in the society where we live right now, what I see is dehumanizing an entire, entire groups of people, illegal immigrants, Muslims, refugees. Uh, these are people who are, there is this entire rhetoric that is making them less valuable they're less human than we are, which is become, going to become permissive for any kind of future uh, torture against them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any responses? I, oh, oh. Any, um, thank you for that great comment. Are there any responses from panelists? I would just say one thing, that, that is, uh, is this on? Yeah. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's working. Um, that is the, uh, oh, the green means on, amazing. Um, th that is one of the, th the glues, I think, that holds the religious opposition together is the common belief in human dignity. And like for uh, our evangelical community, it's very important not to torture people uh, because uh, people are made in the image of God and other religious traditions too. And so to torture the person is actually, the human person is actually uh, transferred to be torturing God and the whole of creation and what, what uh, creation stands for. So it is the dehumanization point you made is very strong in the religious community on this. Thank you, thank yeah. you. All right, so we'll go over to this microphone. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, is this working? Yes. Lovely. Okay, so this question is actually towards Professor Hajar. Um, am I pronouncing that right? Okay, thank you. Um, at one point, you used the phrase a perpetrator-centric perspective. Would you mind elaborating on this thought and how exactly does this differ from the current perspective in cases in the law? Okay, do you have more questions? Oh, no, that's it. Okay, thank you. Now, um, you know, much of the, the uh, particularly where activism and scholarship come together around torture, understandably, it's often focused on victims and what happens to people when they are tortured, and that's an understandable issue. But when you're thinking about like why torture happens or under what circumstances it's enabled or abetted, you cannot understand that by looking at the victims. I mean, we can take account of the fact that those who were tortured in the U.S. torture program were all Muslim men. But in a sense, it's one really has to look at the kinds of understandings about expansive interpretations of executive power and national security and counterterrorism. And so by perpetrator center perspective, perspective I, I oftentimes mean both understanding torture, you must look at the torturers. Mm -hmm. You must look at the context within which torture happens in order to understand what's happening. And then the second meaning of it is to keep in mind that torture is a crime and stay focused on the perpetrators, finding out who they are, exposing them, pursuing them, whether domestically or internationally. So those are my two meanings about perpetrator-centered perspective. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm a retired physician, and in the late 1970s, I was asked by Amnesty International to interview uh, refugees from Argentina, as I'm bilingual. Um, uh, These are people that were tortured in Argentina during the military dictatorship. Uh, I can write a book about the stories I, I heard from these uh, refugees. Um, in 1964, there was a military coup in Brazil. President João Goulart was um, uh, overthrown by the military. Uh, torture was rampant. And this military dictatorship was fully supported by Lyndon Johnson and a democratic majority in Congress. The first thing I want to point out, that torture is not just one party. It's a tradition of our history. Uh, the last dictatorship in Greece, in Europe, tortures, fully supported by the Johnson administration and a democratic majority. So I think that we try to make it simple that this is just Donald Trump and this is very recent. Torture goes back to decades. Waterboarding was done by the Americans in a not much publicized war. After the American-Spanish War in Cuba, America invaded the Philippines. That's where the Americans were practicing waterboarding more than a hundred years ago. The second point is, um, and this is the final, I've seen all mentions, all countries where torture is being applied. Isn't that interesting that after six years of bombings, tortures, Thousands of people killed, and not one word has been mentioned about Syria. Is that possible? Have you read the report from Amnesty International early this year? Summary executions, trials lasting 15 minutes, thousands being killed on a weekly basis, and this man is still in power? And our previous commander-in-chief never raised a finger about what was going on for six years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any responses from our, from our panelists? <laughs> I would just say thank you for mentioning the, the Syria case. And it is a horrific one for people who haven't uh, been reading about it. It's, it includes photo uh, evidence of thousands of people literally tortured to death in the prisons of the Syrian government. So. Uh, and I want to thank you also, uh, oh, there you are. I want to thank you also for mentioning Greece. I'm a Greek American. Uh, I'm actually a Greek citizen as well. And, uh, and I served in Greece with the CIA for two years. The military dictatorship in Greece and the torture that came out of that dictatorship has been so traumatic to Greek society that here we are 44 years later and it's as though it happened yesterday to the Greek psyche. People can't get over it because it was such a, a violent, period in their history. So this is something that affects American policy. You know, we, we have this short-term view that we're going to torture or we're going to support torture and then everything's going to be fine later. Well, it's not fine later. These, these feelings, these feelings of, of anger and abandonment and disappointment in the United States uh, last for generations. We're supposed to be this shining beacon of human rights and civil rights and civil liberties, and it's just simply not true. I want to add one more thing, too. In 1946, we executed Japanese soldiers who waterboarded American prisoners of war. That was an executable, it was a death penalty offense to commit waterboarding. In 1968, 
In, on January 17, 1968, the Washington Post ran a front page photograph of an American soldier waterboarding a North Vietnamese prisoner. The day that that photo was published, the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, ordered an investigation. That soldier was arrested, he was charged with torture, tried, and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Well, the law never changed. We changed. Right? So, I'm asking rhetorically, why was, why was torture wrong in 1946 and wrong in 1978, or I'm sorry, 1968, uh, 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 but not wrong in 2002? Why was it not wrong until 2015? Shame on us. John, I, w I would like to uh, um, ask uh, if it was if it was a uh, torture was actually wrong in 68 uh, Seems like McNamara uh, was part of what we call plausible deniability Because there was a whole program as the speaker here Mentioned about Vietnam it was called the Phoenix program yes. that involved mass assassinations Torture and that that program had emerged out of an earlier program that the CIA had developed in the mid 1950s Later, that program was moved to Latin America. It was called Project X. CIA manuals were later found that were given to military and security officials all across Latin America. We created something called the School of the Americas. The point is that, especially since the Cold War, but even reaching back to the Philippines, torture has been an instrument of counterinsurgency warfare. And uh, we can trace it all the way through. So during the 1990s, there was a lot of pushback on that. But when 9-11 happened, as they say, the gloves came off again. And uh, the, the program was reasserted re re with full, uh, by, you know, full force. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I would point the finger also at, uh, at Congress. Uh, you know, we have these oversight committees, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence that are supposed to oversee and regulate these, these programs. I can tell you that CIA culture is such that the CIA will push and push and push just to see what it can get away with. That's the nature of the organization. The only thing that stops the CIA or that ought to stop the CIA is congressional oversight. But there hasn't been real congressional oversight in this country in decades. We were talking earlier that we really haven't seen real oversight since the Church Committee in the mid-1970s, and in the House, the Otis Pike Committee. Well, Frank Church and Otis Pike are dead, and no leader has really stepped up to stand up to the CIA in all the intervening years. We're talking about what, over 40 years now? 42 years. So, maybe I'm just, you know, talking into the wind, but we need to ride our elected officials and demand that they do their jobs and oversee these organizations like CIA and NSA and FBI. And we don't do that. And why did the CIA get away with spying on the Senate committee oh. doing the research? Oh. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, it became public. Yeah, and, even after and, it became public. I have never been a fan of Dianne Feinstein because she has been nothing more than a cheerleader for the CIA from the minute she started uh, serving on that committee. Nothing more than a cheerleader. It was only when she was embarrassed by John Brennan and by the hacking, the CIA hacking into the Senate's computers that she even went public in the first place. Um, she was also under a great deal of pressure from other members of the, of the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence to just make this thing go away very quickly. John Brennan and the CIA committed a crime against the Senate. They committed a crime against the American people by hacking into that uh, computer system. And, uh, and you know as well as I do that that story just kind of went away. Nobody ever paid the piper. One last quick comment. I believe that the responsibility to resist torture, political, moral, is a responsibility to know our history. Uh, next question. 
treaties are uh, the law of the land under the Constitution. Why didn't the Convention Against Torture carry more weight um, in the courts? I, I, I would start with uh, Mr. Carioca. You know, I, I, I'm not an attorney, but I can tell you that the attitude inside the CIA was to laugh and ignore it. Who's going to challenge us was the attitude. Who's going to arrest us? If the, if the Justice Department and the National Security Council and then the President himself say that we can do these things, then what kind of organization is the United Nations to tell us what we can and can't do? I agree with you 100%. Treaties have the, the force of law. They're the law of the land. We can't just pretend that they don't exist, but that's what we did. And the press went along with that in the aftermath of 9-11. The press never raised an objection. I mean, everybody knows that we're signatories to these, to these treaties, and nobody said anything. And again, in Congress, nobody stood up to say anything. I'm going to give you a very quick, very nerdy law-ish answer to that question. Uh, the United States, the, the torture, the, in U.S. law, and I don't know what other countries are like this, no um, treaty is self-enforcing. In other words, it only becomes enforceable in U.S. courts if U.S. domestic legislation has been passed, kind of bringing the treaty principles down into enforceable law. So there is the, uh, a law, of the federal law that was passed at the time the U.S. ratified the Convention Against Torture. That was the law that criminalized torture. So when you read the torture memos, especially the two, tor well, the one torture memo from August 1, 2002, where, you know, the authors narrow the legal definition of torture, say it's not torture unless it rises to the level of pain equivalent to organ failure or even death. It's not mental torture unless it um, causes suffering that lasts months or even years. Anything less than that is not torture. They were literally writing to find a loophole from the federal law that actually does criminalize torture. So the, the torture memos were written to reinterpret the meaning of torture in order to not be accountable in the future uh, under federal law where it is enforceable. And can I just say one thing about this? Because the the special the former special rapporteur on torture spoke at the Seattle or the Spokane Spokane event, and I'm not sure whether he got into this, but uh, through his work, he actually did establish kind of minimum conditions uh, that need to be met by prisons in any country uh, before it starts to become torture, like 15 days in cell beyond that, it starts to become torture, et cetera, et cetera. And those UN standards are actually, uh, have been worked into a document called the Mandela Rules, which uh, is another UN standard that is out. And there are state prison administrators around the country who are actually looking at those and taking those seriously. And it's actually, it's, it's crazy. It's like one of the first times I've seen people taking anything that the UN does seriously, kind of like what John was saying. These are people that run state prison systems. They're looking at it. They're taking it seriously. And so um, the, this, this is like an, an anomaly in a way. And so we're trying to encourage that. I think Colorado might actually be trying to adopt the Mandela standards as part of how it runs its state prison system. And so um, th this is still really an important, uh, uh, what the UN says is important. I mean, it gets ignored, but we've got to, they got to be a player and they've got to put more pressure on the U.S. to be a lead, uh, to be a part of the global community on human rights, because right now we're absolutely not. So uh, right. Feinstein and McCain helped pass the congressional um, thing to make it solidified in the law. Right, but Feinstein was also the cheerleader. Is that the same Feinstein? So she kind of covered her. And then I, my my other comment was, um, if you foresee after Trump that this could be sealed into the law, I'm wondering if information um, age is helping expedite justice because, you know, I see that Sean Spicer got into Harvard and then Chelsea Manning did not, and I thought, I think the culture calling it a whistleblower when you are you know saving people from torture i think that's almost a derogatory word it's almost like a hero to to leak that to leak information against an enemy when really you know their purpose their it's so I'm wondering, um, yeah, if Feinstein was covering your tracks and if the dissemination of information is going to 
expedite justice, I'm hoping, for, at a grassroots level. Thank you. Feinstein was covering your tracks. When Leon Panetta was named um, CIA director, Feinstein was chairman of the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee, and she insisted that Stephen Kappas be named deputy director of the CIA because Kappas would be sort of the adult in the room, she said. Uh, Panetta didn't know anything about intelligence. He was going to be uh, struggling with a learning curve, and Kappas could educate him. Well, Kappas was one of the fathers of the torture program. Kappas was the one who was, who was there. I mean, Kappas had been there for 32 years, but he was already at a senior level and was part of that decision-making chain that, that made the initial determination to transition into a torture program. So it was Feinstein that, dema that demanded that there was at least that one holdover from the torture regime into the Obama CIA. Um, I want to comment on your last point. Uh, the Greek government hired me two years ago to help them write a new whistleblower protection law. So I went to Athens three times and I was working with the Minister of Justice, who was a great guy. The problem is that there was no, there's no word in the Greek language for whistleblower. So I was trying to explain to him what a whistleblower was. My, my Greek is quite good. And he said, oh, you mean like a snitch or a rat? <laughs> and I said, no, that's not at all what I mean. And so I tried to explain it a second time. And we came up with the, with the term um, defendant of the public good, good, which they adopted as law. <laughs> Great. Not snitch or rat. Uh, it, and your, your final point about the information age, Oh, yeah. I mean, all of us in this room, all of us can be published on this issue. Uh, there are enough outlets uh, online that are read by thousands, even millions of people cumulatively. Uh, we can all have our voices heard, and we couldn't do that even 10 years ago. I would like to just add one more point about the um, McCain-Feinstein Bill, it's an important bill. It, it, it does uh, give legislative, it gives law to the executive order. Uh, it uh, refers to the Army Field Manual as the only standard that can ever be used in interrogations. But I want to remind people that 21 Republican senators voted against McCain-Feinstein, most of whom are still in office, and they include Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions, and several other senators, look them up, look up to 21. So the, the opposition is still very strong, it's around and will continue. Um, that's all I want to say. All right, so in terms of torture, what do you believe are the differences between the Bush, Obama, and Trump administration? Trump is obviously even more vocal, but. Who are you asking? All Anybody the on the panel? Yeah. yeah. She has something to say. So uh, Bush authorized it. <laughs> Obama stopped it and then engaged in targeted killing. When it became too costly to torture people, we like shifted. So if interrogation detention was the cornerstone of counterterrorism policy during the Bush years, as a result of like some of the fights against it and the litigation, et cetera, torture became too politically costly. And so consequently, Obama cancels the torture program and then doesn't want to bring and wants to close Guantanamo, and so there's a direct relationship between the uptick in drone warfare and the sort of exclusion of uh, Guantanamo and the inability to pursue a lawful detention interrogation program because of the enthusiasm that emerges in support of torture after Obama cancels it. And then with Trump, I mean, they're just like, I mean, we're not, haven't taken anybody new to Guantanamo. It's not clear that this administration has any policies whatsoever, but they certainly don't don't have a strategic policy around the question of capture and interrogation. I mean, Bush, Trump may have touted the idea of bringing back the waterboard, but there's no policy on capture as opposed to drone strikes. So drone strikes have actually escalated even more under Trump. I, I would like to add that Obama, I believe, understood that uh, not only Abu Ghraib, but the revelations about CIA torture black sites, rendition, 
had created the greatest legitimacy crisis that the United States had ever faced since the Vietnam War. I believe that. I think it was torture that undermined uh, alliances uh, that put uh, the United States at increasing risk uh, in the Middle East and also in domestic soil. And so he was smart enough to know this, and a lot of other people were as well, that, uh, that, that it, there had to be a course correction. On the other hand, Obama did everything possible, everything possible to prevent any accountability for those who had ordered and committed torture. And he holds a lot of responsibility for that. He kept telling the Americans, we have to look forward, not backwards. I say we have to look backwards in order to look forward. Mr. Obama. <laughs> mm -hmm. Barack Obama also prosecuted more people under the Espionage Act than, than all previous presidents combined, right? The Espionage Act was written in 1917 to combat German saboteurs. From 1917 until 2009, three Americans were prosecuted for uh, speaking to the press. Just during the Obama administration, Eight people were prosecuted, eight people who had been national security professionals were prosecuted for uh, talking about waste, fraud, abuse, and illegality with members of the press. Eight. Unprecedented in American history. Something we, we can't forget also, and I know this is just anecdotal, but, but it's a fact that has stuck in my mind for years. In George W. Bush's last month as president, he killed two people with the use of a drone. In Barack Obama's last month as president, he killed 426 people with drones. So were we torturing people in, at the end of the Obama administration? No. But does it really matter when it comes right down to it? Right. right. That was kind of my thought as well, as in maybe perhaps did Obama actually do the torturing as well? Apart from, I mean, he did say torture is stopping, but did it really under the radar right now? Mm -hmm. I think it's like they want to see it. I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> um, thanks, Laura. Any other comments about in response to Laura's? Yes. Comments? Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, and uh, uh, over here. Yeah, hi. Um, given all that's been said tonight, given the political crisis in this country, the crisis around the world, everything that's going on, and the craziness of the Trump Pence administration, do y'all, this is to everybody, do y'all think this country is possibly or likely moving towards a dictatorship? And what would that mean for this whole issue of torture? And you know, another way of putting this is, is there an after Trump to look towards for dealing with this stuff? I think we should start with Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks a lot. Um, uh, there's certainly enough uh, public uh, conversation about that issue that's not just happening with us, but people like George Will and other, I mean, you know, conservatives, to make a case that uh, if we're not moving in that direction, uh, they certainly feel like there's a chance that we could under Trump. Um, so this wouldn't necessarily be me speaking, but I think there's enough, uh, there's enough out there in the public discussion that, that that is something that people are considering. Um, I don't know exactly how we deal with that in Washington, D.C. We, for example, as an organization, do not talk about um, a possible dictatorship, although it shows all the marks of that. Do not talk about a possible uh, comparison to Hitler, although it does show some of those marks as well. Should things, you know, go crazy with the Muslim ban or who knows what else, the targeting of Muslims in this country. We, we have to kind of keep it a little bit up and, up and up in Washington, and that's a little bit where people are at now. So what we are hoping and what is just barely breaking the surface, and I don't, I don't know how this is ever going to happen, but the Republicans in Washington D.C. really need to start standing up 
to this president uh, with almost everything that he does. I mean, we see just this little glimmer on health care. I don't know how much further it's going to go, but that's the only way it's going to keep it at some level from getting worse. And even that might not be enough of a defense, but we have to play that game uh, in Washington. And it's not a very strong hand, but it's kind of what we have, you know, in addition to all the grassroots stuff that we're all doing out here, too. It's kind of what we have to get people ready for, uh, you know, stopping measures. But I mean, a lot of stuff that would mark, be hallmark of a dictatorship uh, will get through and are getting through without any uh, resistance and opposition. In fact, without any knowledge of a lot of the American people, actually, that it's even happening. So. All right. Any other responses? Oh, go ahead, Lisa. I mean, the one thing I would say is that, you know, I think that uh, Rob very eloquently um, reflected back to many of you here the significance of grassroots uh, organizing. I also would say that um, even when it comes to the Muslim ban and other things, like there's a very important role for lawyers, you know, because to the extent that we still harbor, you know, the idea that we are a nation of laws and not men, that's important. And, you know, uh, I find that the worst of times in this country make me the most happy to be a college professor, because I really feel like colleges and universities are one of the places where you can you know, invest in the future in some way through teaching. So that's my upbeat answer. I almost never give an upbeat answer. <laughs> I assume that There's no one. on your shirt means no dictatorship. Is that kind of what that means? Uh, yeah, okay, good. Okay. That's what I thought. Lisa, All right. good. Lisa, there's You're in life good company after college. Here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Well, um, I think that concludes our event. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank all the sponsors of this event. I want to thank the ACLU. I want to thank Congressman McDermott, and I want to thank our four wonderful speakers. So, thank you.